Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. Please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have a great pleasure because he's a returning pleasure. There's my friend, Minter Dial, who's a speaker, author, and consultant, and friend of the podcast. He has referred me on to numerous people, but has also been a guest back in February 2019, where we talked about his book uh, about empathy. Um, but he's going to tell us why he's here today. Um, but hello, Minter. We talk all the time, but welcome to the podcest. Hey, Adrian. It's always fun to have a microphone that's actually recording in between <laughs> us and see how it changes the course of our discussion. But um, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm here because you invited me. I appreciate that. And because I have, uh, I've got another book coming out. So that's um, probably top of my mind these days. Perfect. But so before we get into um, the, um, the new book, um, can you give us a bit of a thumbnail sketch on yourself? I mean, just for the benefit of those people that aren't, I mean, I always like to think that we have long time subscribers, you know, when this interview comes out, which will be in the early part of January of 2021, I will have been podcasting for 10 years. Like, oh my fucking God. It's a, <laughs> it's a decade. It is. Oh my word. It but um, And it's a journey. And it's a journey. It's a journey. I tell you what, I, I here and I will say, podcasting makes me smarter. Hmm. Well, I, I tend to say the same thing, Adrian, as you know, I have mine that also just recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. And there's the, the idea of the content and the exchange with the guest because I do always guest interviews like you. And then there's the actually doing the things. So, you know, ah, podcasting is the thing. Yeah, actually we do it. Mm -hmm. So that means we understand what it means to get the tech. We understand what it means to produce, put it up, track it, distribute it and so on. So there's a, that also is a, is a tremendous learning. And I think well, it's do the often, research as well and the prep and then the kind oh, of, God, the, yes. um, and then the kind of post-production sort of like, kind of a, well yeah the post-production sort of bit where for me that's where the the heart and soul of it is for me in the, in that you learn kind of like so much um through the process that's why i say it, it just makes me smarter not just because of the setup and everything else but the actual thinking about the content totally and, and the process know, of it re reading having to read the book or <laughs> that the guest has read you know hopefully there's a little bit of goodness in there and yeah and then researching the types of questions to try not to have just the same old damn questions all the time. Make yeah, sure what's it, your name? Yeah, you <laughs> where'd got, you come you got, from? No, but a little injection of the punk in you into what you do. Yeah. So anyway, tell us about you, Minter, for the people that are not, you know, immediately familiar uh, with you. So we just give people a thumbnail sketch. Uh, 56 years old, um, nominally an American with a French passport, born in Belgium, uh, educated in England and uh, currently living in England. 56 years, uh, 15, 1, 5, country changes, 3, 4, 34, home changes, 
one wife, and uh, but on a mission that includes wanting to continue to change myself. And this year has been 2020, a year of great transformation mm -hmm. and stimulation, not always easy or fun. And part of where I am today is recognizing more and more the lesser fun things. I, I've, I've gone about being an optimist and, and my wife is generally on the other side of the track. And maybe I feel like I've moved towards her position more, understanding that sometimes I need to understand that I'm not always feeling great. It's okay not to be okay. And, yeah, and integrate hear that. into my, my discourse, into my book, and not being just the rah-rah leader, but one that hopefully is more like real, real, as opposed to rah-rah. You know, um, thank you for that. I hear huge echoes of myself and some of the things that I've gone through over the course of the last year. I think uh, that... I don't think there will be many people that have come out of the uh, of 2020 unscarred in whatever different ways. And um, but I think you're absolutely right. And you know, sometimes it's you pride yourself on being positive and optimistic, and you know, on the front foot and all these different sort of things. But also to recognise, you know, what this year is or what 2020 taught taught me is that you know. It's okay to not be okay for a little while, and to and be yet, and to and to say that as as you know, so like I'm actually not okay right now. Exactly, and and yet the the onus is not to, or at least the onus, the charge that I give myself is not to wallow in self pity and so on. Mm -mm. So it then becomes an issue of of how do you get, gather the energy, how do you tap into that, and so there. What I've been working on is being explicit in my intention of mm. recapturing energy. Mm. What do I need to do? Recognizing that I'm in a low, but what can I do? And then having the discipline to do it. So yeah. make, make my bed first thing I do. When, well, after having done meditation, I make my bed. Then I have uh, some habits that I want to instill, which are good habits, as in I eat a super healthy breakfast. Mm -hmm. It would be nothing easier than just doing a little bit of a, you know, a quickie. But no, I, I make myself a, a healthy breakfast and I feel good about that. All right, that's getting me on a start. And then I integrate one and a half hours of walking every day where that's how I consume my podcasts as well. But I'm also doing exercise. And then at the end of the day, I introduce, I play music for 30 minutes. So, all right, I have the time to do that because that is what I need. Energy, live in the now. And if it's always about, I don't have time to do that shit, well then actually, where's your life? Sure. Sure, sure. No, I get it. Um, and I think there's probably lessons in, in, in that for all of us. But let's go, because I think this, all of what you're talking about, I think you can sort of explore in the, in the new book. And the new book will, as, it, as this comes out around the in early part of January, the new book will just be coming out. And it's called You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. So can you tell me about it? And, you know, like, frankly, Minty, you're turning into a book machine. You know, <laughs> there was like the, the book on empathy and then there was The Last Ring Home, which turned into kind of a documentary, an award-winning documentary, no less, and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And then before that, there was Future Proof, which was with uh, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb Stalky. And you, I mean, <laughs> yeah, machine is... Well, I, I feel like I'm actually in a third gear. I, I, what I, I think of third gear as a sort of a long-term gear. It's able to rev up. You can sort of drive slowly in it, but it's got a, a strength to it, third mm -hmm. gear. And, and, uh, and therefore, let's say the power, the gasoline that's helping that is I feel like I'm on this mission and I want to do it on a long burn mm -hmm. to the extent that I, don't, I plan to continue to do it. Sure. So I want to stay in a in a gear that means I can be productive. And this book actually was, I mean, it's something I feel is me. And when I originally set out to write it, it was actually back in 2014. Okay. And I wrote 30,000 words. And then the floor fell out because I got a call from the television station saying, I want to put your television, your film on TV. 
Right. I was like, oh, fruits, but that, I, how do I do both? <laughs> and, and so I had to put the book on the side and I went and did a film tour, book tour and all that with the film. And then I said, all right, great. I'll go back to the writing the book of my life. Little did I know that I already had written the book of my life, which was The Last Ring Home. Yeah. And then um, I wrote another 30,000 words. I went to uh, Reykjavik in Iceland, wrote 30,000 words. I now have 60,000 words. I said, good enough for any normal business book. And then all of a sudden, another bomb hit. And I ended up writing future books. So I've had this book within me for a long time. And, and frankly, that allowed me to mature in how I wanted to position it. And so we ended up really positioning it as a leadership book. It's leadership in business, but it's actually leadership in life. Mm -hmm. And I really subscribe to this idea. If you know how to lead your life, you are going to have a better chance of leading a business. There are business skills and business acumen you need to have. But actually, when it comes down to relationships and a thing called authenticity mm -hmm. and long-term energy, that only comes in the personal space. Yeah, no, I think so. And, and you talked about it earlier about kind of taking, noticing things and then taking control of your own sort of energy. And I remember talking a, oh, a few weeks ago to a gentleman by the name of Joseph Michelli, who spoke to a number of leaders across the course of the, the pandemic, 140 actually leaders, he, you know, and he was, uh, he was massive different, that massive effort. And he basically did this book, 140 leaders, curated all the insights and then produced this book in with a major publisher in the space of five months, which is unheard of. It's called Stronger Through Adversity. It's just like remarkable from on the, mostly on the kind of not the individual effort, but mostly on just the individual effort, but on the major publisher side for them to move no, that fast. Oh, just... My goodness. Right. We know, we know that's crazy. <laughs> um, but he was talking about one of the big things that come that came out of that was this idea of self care. Mm um and so do you think that i mean i was thinking about the kind of the book and and I, having gone through it a little bit i wanted just to rather than actually just go to lay it all out just wanted to dig into a few things i mean do you think that what's emerging what you're finding what you're talking about is is this, are we talk, are, are, is it going to evolve into a new style of leadership i mean are, is that what we're talking about or are we almost like just turning up the volume or kind of like focusing the lens on things that are fundamental and core to sustainability. Well, yeah, sustainability is an interesting word. I think it's, it's more changing of the dial than pardon the pun indeed than suggesting that it's a entirely new form of leadership. I mean, I think it, I would have a delusion of grandeur if that's what I'm trying to do here really nudging is, is is about as much as i can do and the first nudge you mentioned self-care is around self-awareness mm -hmm. and the issue with that is that if you have been in business let's say like i have for 30 years i'm tending to think i've done a few things i tending to think i'm successful therefore i why should i change from modeling or re replicating the behaviors that I've done in the past because it's got to me where I've got to. Sure. And, and then the, the issue is moving off that high horse, putting aside a tad one's ego, having that ability and then having a raw talk with oneself or helped, by the way, it can be a coach or a spouse or whomever can help you really lean into yourself. Mm -hmm. And then and then, it, and then thinking about self-care, because if you can provide with uh, greater awareness for yourself, then you're going to know when you need more self-care. Because mm. it isn't about just bemoaning my fate all the goddamn time. Because I've got to, you know, I, I, I want to do things. And you can't just sort of moan and, and groan through leadership either. So you have to find a balance. And that's the nuance that I'm looking at. It's a nudge. It's a turning of the dial to look at ways to tap into your own discretionary energy. And then once you know how to do that for yourself, you're going to be better equipped to do mm. it with others. Mm -hmm. But that will include being self-aware enough about how you are at home. Are you being a dick with your family? Are you paying attention to your children? Sure. How, how are you in the personal sphere? Because that is 
also part of how you grow and how you become stronger. Sure. And anyone who thinks you can dissect, oh, I'm great at performing. I'm going to get the next efficiency. I'm going to deliver the next quarterly profits. But you know, you're you're, you're screwing around at home with three lovers and a wife. Mm -hmm. And what is this? Well, sure. I mean, I think it's it, it seems to me that the self awareness, but really tuning into kind of like what's going to go on for you. But then also there's that there's a before you get to the sort of self care. I think there's a um, there's a responsibility layer because some people can become aware that they might be not very happy or they might be being dicks, but they don't do anything about it, right? No, right. <laughs> I, I I like to call out Travis Kalanick. And, and I had a long uh, argument with a friend about whether or not we should forgive him. And with his uh, Christian background, he was uh, of the mind that I need to forgive somebody who's been a dick for 20 years. And I just said, well, I, I'm afraid I can't handle that. I think that he, in this case, had 20 years to discover that he was being a dick. He had 20 years to figure it out. He had 20 years of choosing friends who prepared to tell him that he's being a dick, or he just rolled in his own little trip and along the way didn't care about the damage he was doing. Mm -hmm. And now he gets to sail off into the sun with several billions. No, -uh, he doesn't get my forgiveness. Yeah, that's, no, how, I I, think, that, that's uh, how I roll. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, completely. I think I think this what's fascinating about that, the idea about, you know, um, why should you seek forgiveness? Why don't you actually go and earn the forgiveness? Because mm -hmm. he sure should just writing a letter is, yeah. Table like stakes. Going, you I know, mean, so that's, that's well. just. A, it's like, you, do, why don't you do something that that changes people's perception of you? Uh -huh. Well, and that that'll be it'll be a tough a tough pill for me to swallow. Should he come up to me, hey, Minter, it's Travis. I need to show you I've changed. Good luck. Try. Yeah, it. like, going, well done. Carry on. Anyway, yeah. um, so tell me about the kind of the other thing I wanted is kind of the the that I, I wanted to ask you about was this idea that that I saw in the book was that this you mentioned the social employee the power of the idea and and the idea and how that combines with how leaders help or hinder and it just like you know it kind of struck me that the um, that what you're talking about here because the many leadership books talk about just the person right. But you're also talking about leadership and being a leader and how it sort of you interact with people. I don't mean communication, but just how you connect with kind of people and the power of that connection and the influence that comes thereof, I believe. So can you tell me a little about what the social employee, the power of the idea and how leaders help or hinder? Right. So I, I think the, the, the central tenet is the inside out model, which I call the inside out model suggests that you need to be as the leader, the one that incarnates at the strongest level. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk about a, a, a test, which is somewhat abstract, especially if you don't like tattoos, but it's, um, it's about the idea of whether you're willing to tattoo your body with a piece of the company or representation of the right. company for which you're working. And, and f in full acceptance and knowledge of the fact that one day you will no longer be working there, which means that the tattoo is designed to stay after you've left. Mm -hmm. So whether you stay for one more year, 30 more years is not part of this discussion. It's to what extent you are incarnating the values of the brand, believe in those values, and then thinking about how you can draw in inside out the core people who are at the, you know, the start the middle center of the company into your stakeholders who can be independent contractors or distributors who are helping to distribute your product into your core seller buyers and the teams, people that are using whatever services or products that you are selling. And so the, the notion of having a social employee is lovely, except if they aren't well-trained, if you will, or at least breathing and drinking the same Kool-Aid Mm. And then once you, if you can align those people with you, with, let's say, the big idea of what you're trying to do as an organization, then the chances are that they will have the right intentions as they go out to promote 
the the company, not in a salesy manner, but in a sort of a holistic. This is what we're around for. This is what we believe in. Or mm. by the way, I have a product with these features and benefits. Sure. But really focus in on that purpose, what we're there for. Understand why you would have, why any of your employees would want to have a tattoo of the body, of the brand on their body, independent of whether they like tattoos. It's just the abstraction of the idea. Mm-hmm. And then and then really lean in on that. And then your chances of having a stronger social employee who's able to resonate and bring part of the messages out is going to be done from a good place because they fundamentally believe in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And when they speak, they will speak with good intentions. And sure, they're going to screw it up a few times. But so will you, by the way. Yeah, it's normal. It's life, right? Um, and I think that's the thing is that, yeah, maybe that's a, a question that, that is that would be useful to ask can people because the um because a tattoo is is, is uh, whether you, as you say whether you like them or not whether you have them or not is an idea of it relates to permanence but also pride and history as it were and it, it, i guess the, you're asking the question are you proud of the work you do and where you work and what it stands for and its impact on its people and its community and, and so on and so forth. And if you are, then you shouldn't be ashamed to go, bang, I have got that on my arm. Yeah, so there is a, let's say a, a pushback on that, which is this notion of, of pride in a project because you can get take meaningfulness and pride out of a, a small project. Mm-hmm. I, I won the football match today. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that I should tattoo two to one on my on my chest? Mm-hmm. No, because that was a meaningful objective. We achieved the victory two to one. And then what is the permanence of it? So what you should be inscribing is more the value that's underneath that two to one. Mm-hmm. You know, the team effort or some spirit that was that brought you to the two to one. Sure. And that's the deeper meaningfulness. So it's tapping into the bigger meaningfulness, which generally means more than just me lifting the trophy, because that which you can have great pride in, but move it into we lifted the trophy and what is we. And and so it's it's just about the the nuances, just trying to figure out how it taps into the bigger, the bigger idea, the bigger dream. Mm -hmm. Because it's it, i mean the idea of pride in achieving a project is really useful making well, it's a, a tangible yeah. item i think and also but but i guess you're you're absolutely right it's like also are you proud to be part of the the bigger effort and do um, you know do you know what your role is in mm-hmm. it which as a leader is in the inside out model is absolutely critical making everyone aware from the janitor up to the senior vice president or whatever everybody needs to recognize their contribution to that and feel heard and feel that they are contributing and that is what's going to drive that discretion and energy that i was talking about yeah and i think also the other thing i I was i would say is that we also need to dispel this idea that leadership is only for senior uh, for people in senior positions Mm. well my one of the singular premises of the book is that you're the leader of you Mm -hmm. exactly and whether you're leading 5,000 people, 10,000 people outside in a company or two and a half people at home, whatever, mm-hmm. you, you start with you and, and you need to be able to lead yourself with a certain regime that allows you to not say, I didn't have the time. Well, that's a, exactly that. And I think this is something I've been kind of like <clears throat> leaning into or leaning on uh, over the last oh, few months, if not longer. Is about creating this space to do that, to allow that sort of development or that new understanding or new learning to to take place. I mean, I sometimes recoil in horror when I hear people say, you know, I've got a meeting scheduled and they show up a few minutes late and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. And they're like, I'm in back-to-back meetings. And I just... It fills me full of horror. I think kind of like, when do you have the space mm. to do anything? But you talk about 
allocating sufficient time to understand and learn from experiences and experiments. I mean, what are good ways to create this space? I mean, you talk about, you know, because to allow that personal kind of growth, that, you know, that development, as it were. What have well, you found? So, what have you learned? What have you heard? Well, the, I, I, I like to say I practice what I preach. So the first thing was to integrate into my schedule learning time. Mm -hmm. So this would essentially mean, uh, and, and the way I do it, because I'm practical, is I, I have a, a moment in the morning when I catch up. I catch up with my deepest passions, which happen to be the Grateful Dead and the Philadelphia Flyers hockey team. Uh -huh. And I've been following them, if you will, throughout all my life. So I want to know about them. Uh -huh. And then I, I have some other things I want to follow up on, which so I have Flipboard, which has a tech folder, a tech board where I sort of see what the news is in tech. Uh -huh. And I want to stay up to date. So I have a very much a regime that is both personal and professional right. in, the in the morning. So the discipline to seek out information and stay up to date. That's what I need to do. So whatever you need to learn, you need to integrate that into your regime some point during your day. Mm -hmm. So it's a regular continuous learning. The second thing is that when I was running, well, in, as, as a head guy running the different businesses I, I got to, I, I came to the agreement or arrangement, which I didn't have at the beginning, which I needed to block out time. Mm. So with my assistant, whether it was Marianne in New York or Sandy in, in Montreal, um, I would have them block off half the day, every mm -hmm. day. And that didn't mean that it was immutable because if the boss called and said, hey, mentor, I need you. No, yes, sir. Right. Pragmatic. Yet the idea behind these half days was to allow myself the incidental, the accidental time because mm -hmm. shit happens, unexpected stuff expectedly happens mm -hmm. so this was my that's that's a that's a key element to allowing not to be back-to-back -back meetings to have time to write the strategic messages so that i master my time not the victim of my time and having that idea of the 24 hours or whatever the, we have the limitation of the time and not eating into other parts of the time because you end up with a day full of meetings. Then what happens is you got, well, shit, I got 120 messages that are waiting for me. And you start needing to do that. And that's going to eat into your dinner time with a family. And then that's not going to go well. Mm -hmm. So the, the third thing in the realm of, of things to list to, to get learning to embed is to do it with others. Mm -hmm. And the posture is, well, what did we learn together? Mm -hmm. And legitimately be in the mode of, well, other people can teach me the learnings as well. So that means showing, hey, listen, I, wow, that was a first time for me. So when the, when the boss says that, he, or in this case, me, would be saying, well, you know, I'm showing I don't know shit. I don't know everything. And it's a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of humility, and make it a group learning. So, for example, if you, whenever you're doing a session, maybe there's an opportunity for everybody to discuss. I mean, I, I would that it were actually more of a discussion. But oftentimes the way it works is you got a table and you, you were so formatted, you know, go around the table. What did everyone learn? What, I, what would be ideal if I were to be doing it today would be, hey, let's just break off into twos and threes at the table, discuss for five minutes, what did we learn? And then let's debrief that. And I'm sure that that mode of a debrief of the learnings we had of an activity or a project or whatever would be a lot more powerful. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's absolutely right. And I think what's what's fascinating for me is that there's the whole thing is that um, one of the things I've, I've noticed over the last kind of few months is how because we've had to change with a, sig a significantly different operating environment, it's put bigger pressures or stresses and strains on people that are in leadership, management, supervisory kind of positions. And I think it's forced us to re-examine some of these things. And I've, it's something that I've been thinking about around this, an emergence of a, when we talk about customer experience and then employee experience, and I think there's, this, there's an emerging domain around stakeholder experience, i.e. Mm -hmm. how does a community measure an organization's impact on the, on the world at all sorts mm -hmm. of different levels. Mm -hmm. But then there's another 
one, which is the experience of the leader and the leader's experience. And I think that needs kind of re-examining. And you talk about it and kind of the you lead. It's like, it's not just about going on courses and learning skills and kind of doing all these different things. It's all, it's almost like taking responsibility for all that. So I think it's, a, it's the, the, the examination of it and then what you're talking about in the book, I think is really timely. And I think it fits in with that. And it need, we need to re-examine it because we make some really big assumptions about um, particularly how we've moved to different operating models. And we'll probably continue to move again. So it won't go back to what it was, but it'll probably be a hybrid type of thing. And re-examining, reassessing, reappraising kind of what leadership looks like in a modern organization kind of mm. is, is is important so i think what you're exploring can you hear and how what what is the individual's role and responsibility in that is i think is massively important mm. um and very and very timely but what i wanted to do is to kind of bring it back to the primary focus of kind of what we can talk about on the on the on the, on the podcast and that's generally about experience and i mentioned customer experience and employee experience and then i i was in the book and uh, and i was browsing around and then you started to, you started to tackle what comes first mm -hmm. is the heart the core of the the car of the horse type of question is like going is it, so i want you to take on it because like this is a big discussion point right is when mm -hmm. if you want to produce an organization that drives these better outcomes right what do you think? Employee first or customer first? What's the which one's the car? Which one's the horse, Minter? Well, Show me your so cards. Indeed, I, I have them, and I have with a hat tip to Stan Phelps. What it, it strikes me all the same that actually most organizations don't de facto believe in either of those. Okay. The vast, the vast majority of companies are still focused on survival and profitability and quarterly results. And that is de facto the focus. Yeah, yeah, of course they say things like, you know, customer's king. Yeah, 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 really customer's important. But the issue is, are you behaving in a way that actually comes, comes around? So the second phase is, all right, oh yeah, actually the customer is fucking important. Customer is paying me, cool, that's important. You don't think that's gonna change over the last kind of like, nine months or so that we've we've seen actually what's been exposed is, is the, the rhetorical gap yeah you know between the rhetoric and the action and the real action right well and and, I, and part of that is also because going into it many companies didn't have the cash and so they're now falling back on some pavlovian fear-based type or more survival-based thinking which doesn't afford many people the luxury to do long-term thinking and long-term planning. So th that is a, somehow the consequence of that gap now mm -hmm. falling into place, but not always. Yet, then once you've got the idea that your customer is really important and probably pays the bills, <laughs> it has become so gosh darn important to have your employees delivering that experience. So here, here's the sort of analogy or example that I think can be very speaking, very um, evocative. All right, customer's really important. Great. Let's, um, how do we explicit that? What's the behavior that's going to show that we really believe the customer's important? Well, we're going to make that, of course, that's what you do, right? So here's, what, here's an example. We're going to make sure that every customer message we can get back to within 24 hours. All right, does everyone agree with that? Oh yeah, that, that would show that the customer's at the table, that we are really customer focused. Great, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Well, the question that I have is, are you aligned with your communication style within the company? By which I'm not saying that you need to have a habit of responding to each email within 24 hours. Yeah. Because that will be a walking disaster. The cart will not move to use your analogy, because what happens is the way you get the answer for the customer is I might hey, write a message to Adrian. Hey, listen, I have customer. They got a problem. I don't know the answer. Adrian, you the expert in, can you help me understand how to answer that? You write back. Oh, I don't understand that. 
right back, right back, exchange, exchange. Oh, I get it. Now this is what I need to say to the customer. Now I go back to the customer within 24 hours. If, if Adrian and Minter have established a 24 hour rule for one email, then that's broken. So the point I'm trying to get to is, are you aligning the way you are within the company to mm -hmm. the way you want to go outside? Another example is empathy. A lot of people say, oh, empathy is really important. That sort of switched on to this new buzzword. Oh yeah, we should be empathic. Uh, we understand our customer, walk in their shoes because they're the king. Well, if you haven't inscribed empathy within the core of your system, my inside out model, then it's unlikely that your employees are going to serve with empathy your customers. Mm -hmm. So the fundamental, huge bottom line, Adrian, mm -hmm. is you've got to get the employee experience right first. By the way, start with yourself, mm. make the employees feel it, live it, and then you're going to be better able to service and provide that experience for the customers. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you touched on a couple of things. One is the, um, we talked about this before, um, kind of the empathy sort of thing. But again, you talk about the leadership side of things and this idea that you talked about walking in your customer's shoes. And then I think about the sort of modern organization and people talk about, we need to be, you know, the data driven decision-making and all those sort of things. So like, what does walking in your customer's shoes really mean in a modern organization? And, you know, do we need to find people that are like salmon in many well, ways? So, so I, I think it may be splitting this into modern organizations. So we have the, well, I don't mean to the, there's a current context, right? Kind of like. Oh, I understand that. Well, I was just going to just break it down for like the entrepreneurial startup-y kind of mode. Right. And a, and a legacy 50,000 people kind of mode. I just mm -hmm. wanted to spit those two up. Right. Because you've got the flat, agile, pivoting every 20 seconds kind of organization, which is really modern. The other one is uh, one brings in legacy systems, legacy thinking, legacy people, and, and they're trying to modernize. And, and so what is, what is walking the shoes of the latter? Because the first one hopefully is a little easier. Mm. It's, you know, it's, they sort of got the program and yet they of course are, are running down. How do I be more efficient, more AI, more this, that. But the thing that struck me was that as a leader, and, and this is my experience, Adrian, which is you get closed off, you get put in a fishbowl. Everyone's looking at every move you do and they're feeding you the things that they want, that you, they think you want. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge is breaking down those barriers and actually going out. And so rather than prepare a manicured visit of the field, such that the salesperson looks good in your eyes and makes everybody, makes me think I know what's going on, mm -hmm. but, but they spent 48 hours preparing the field visit, which isn't close to reality. Go and learn how to be in the field. And the key, when I say learn how to be in the field is ask questions without judgment, mm -hmm. listen without retorking and needing to respond and defend how my product was crap, which tends to fire off our need to say, oh, no, no, it's not, it's a great product. Why do you say yeah. that? And then the person doesn't have the desire to really feed into and help you with some legitimate feedback. Anyway, last um, comment I have or example, to be concrete is uh, I'd love to cite Ronan Dunn, the Irish um, CEO of Verizon Wireless. He right. used to be on O2 in, in Britain. I think it was O2. And anyway, he, he writes about how he spends 15 minutes of his day on Twitter, mm -hmm. where he has many tens of thousands of followers. And what he does is he uses those 15 minutes on Twitter and he, and he, and he, and I quote him as a walk down the aisle to be with the customer mm -hmm. and and he, that will allow that allows him to short circuit the whole boardroom monolithic type of conversation or political conversations worse that are, are, are allowing him to say I, he actually knows how it's going on and and why that's brilliant in in the mobile business it's all about complaints mm -hmm. everybody's complaining but he isn't afraid not only to listen but to participate and say i'm sorry i'm going to take care of that i'm going to so by, by modeling that behavior, then he's suggesting the rest of his team can. So all of a sudden you have the social employee 
participating in not just leaving it to the poor old customer service to get flogged because yeah. I got, I, we had one more shitty product service after another. I think that's, that's great. And what it, it does actually kind of show because they, um, what it does actually show is that there are various ways to do it. Now, what we're not advocating is that, you know, that you go and be say Terry Lee, you know, the, the former CEO of Tesco's who repeatedly spent 40% of his time in stores every week, either working or walking the aisles, talking to customers, listening, observing all these different sort of things. Um, because that's quite an undertaking, right? We're not necessarily advocating um, that you go undercover and go in and, and, and do that. But actually it could be there are there's there is a spectrum mm -hmm. of opportunity can hear. And maybe you have to kind of pick and mix. So yeah. it, because otherwise it it's the variety of the insights that you get from different sources that is where the, the real insight kind of is, yeah, I guess. I, and I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, if you're spending 40% of your time outside, then that means you don't have 40% of your time to do other things. And so you need to know you have a good team and, and you are parsing out the tasks. Otherwise, if, and, and you're allowing for decision-making to happen without you because that's what typically is the meetings are for. So you need to organize yourself in an appropriate manner for that to work. The other example that I, I like to cite is uh, my friend Kevin Ryan, who founded MongoDB, Business Insider, mm -hmm. and Gilt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Kevin uh, talked about when he was CEO of Gilt.com, the, the luxury fast sales site, he would talk about having his entire team spend a half a day with customer service, mm. manning, manning the phones every month. And, and while that might seem like a, a less v varied experience, reality is you're only going to get a little snippet. Yeah. But there are two things that were going on. First of all, he was showing that the customer service is important. They're not some sort of stupid group of lesser educated people that were sending off site doing it and, and think of them as a piss in the pain in the ass type of cost center. No, we, we value customer service. And two, I'm going to learn actually what's happening at the coal mine. Coal mine. And, and, and whether I'm in the finance, in marketing, sales, HR, I'm going to learn who the customer is. And that is a fundamental way to get your organization customer centric. I think, this is, I think you're absolutely right. But I think the difference in, in all of that is that you end up with a visceral understanding of... I mean, again, it's that the, the, the um, collapsing the gap between rhetoric and mm -hmm. kind of a, action or real kind of like understanding. Um, can you say, oh, this is important. But until you actually kind of like feel mm -hmm. <laughs> when, you know, when uh, customer hits service or complaint hits organization and you understand mm -hmm. kind of how that kind of like that, that happens, then you're sort of not going to get it. Yeah, and I, I think guess there's a, you know, it's, yeah. it's a grittiness, right? And, yeah. and, and the challenge, of course, is you were in there for one day, you heard 17 customers, you have, you have a million customers, 17 is not a million. No. So you need to accumulate enough of these battle stories to be able to say, well, I heard the one time, right? Well, one time is good, because most CEOs don't even do that. They, or unless they get a, a letter that got through the secretary and you know sort of landed on their desk. But for the most part, they're not going out and wanting to listen with an open ear. And, mm. and then over time, you accumulate the stories, and then all of a sudden, that becomes the backbone of your decision-making in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and also, there's the other kind of like um, ripple effects that come from that. It's like as a leader, if you show up and keep showing up, not just to the customers, but also to the, to the people that work in service and things. And then it just has this amplification effect, like going, ah. you end up with an open channel, but also a set of people that hopefully that become your trusted advisors. And another thing that I wanted to bring in my experience is, is um, when I started doing this myself with when I was in Canada, working with the customer service team, there was change going on and fear through change. Mm -hmm. So the customer service agents first thought is what? We're being monitored. Well, yeah. 
And, and that can be a very destabilizing thing. So the way you introduce that into a system, if you're new and you really think that was a great idea, hey, I really want to do that. Don't just go in bull in a china shop approach. Think through your intentionality, how you're going to be introduced, because otherwise it's going to go wonkers. And so great, great ideas still need to be executed in a way that's intelligible. And that's where you bring in your human intelligence. And, and you don't just say, well, it's for the greater good. It's for the result. Uh, it's not just about the result. Mm -hmm. You need to think about the messiness of relationships. You need to be in the shoes of the empathy of the customer service agent who now is sitting beside the CMO of the company. Oh, this is a person I've only ever read emails from. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So is there anything you'd like to um add about the about the book or the things that kind of like you stood out you'd like to share because i'd also like to just to kind of get your perspective on just some of the stuff that's been going on around us over the last the last kind of few months i mean um yeah you lead anything yeah, that we so, need to know what do we need to know well, yeah i think i have become more and more aware of my own desire my drive and leaned into that and wanting to produce it and therefore wanting to hopefully draw people into their own version of it and so i try to lead by example and and uh, too often we wait for a life-changing moment to make the switch to do mm. what's important also you need to be practical and pragmatic if you don't have food on the plate then that's what's important so finally that balance that's the balance between yeah. the practical the pragmatic and the desire for the big meaningful. And, and uh, so I'm hoping that people will take permission to take the time to be more aware of themselves, take the time to genuinely figure out who they are. Uh, and it's not gonna be a perfect picture, but spend more time thinking about it. Because once you do that, then you understand, and then you understand why you exist. Mm -hmm. And it's going to help you take chips off the shoulder. It's going to allow the ego to sort of to subside and be able to help focus on listening and contributing in a bigger sphere mm -hmm. with you. And that really is what I want out of you lead, but it's also my general mantra and mission going forward. And so I, I have a couple other books in me, Adrian. Um, I don't know which one I'm going to do next, but I, I, I still have a few more ways to nudge people forward. And that's what I'm trying to do. Perfect. Well, let, we'll start with you lead and then we'll kind of like, we'll get ready on the um, on the next two. But if I ask you, uh, what I wanted to do is also to ask you to reflect on kind of like some of the things that, that the big themes that have stood out for you over the last kind of few months, particularly in the, in the realm of, you know, I know that you're a very keen watcher of the digital environment and also branding and things. You just think about, you know, what stood out from you within those sort of domains of, and, and how they relate to service and, you know, and experience. And what are some of the things we think we should be looking out for? You know, where are the kind of, where are the potholes in, in, you know, in, in, in future that we need to go, uh, we need to be aware of those. Well, uh, the, the vast question. And I, I think um, of, how through the pandemic the the premise of the book became clearer and stronger mm -hmm. which is that as i look at you in our interview and you look at me you're seeing me in a in a mode in my home with the nooks and crannies uh farts and whistles huh. as well as a few bells that are me yeah and, and that is what's important. Whereas before we used to wear a starched clean shirt, brought it into the office with the perfectly clean desk, we're now seeing me in all my weird glory. And, and really that, that's a fundamental thing, which leads me to the second thing, which is transparency. Mm. And so we have a screen that is somewhat transparent actually. Mm -hmm leads us into presenting an image while we're on Instagram, we can still use filters. And of course we can use green screens, but uh, in, in a zoom, but we're in more of a transparent mode. The question then becomes how much transparency is right. Mm -hmm. Should I be looking for hundred percent transparency? 
because we all know that transparency is one of the kickers to trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is the glue for making remote work work. Mm -hmm. So the link with all this is knowing how to bring how much of you that looks genuine, that is a window into who I am, but doesn't include my dirty underwear. It includes, I like to say, it goes from my tie to my tie dye. Mm -hmm. So the business persona, the deadhead, bone shaking, wiggling dancer who enjoys the Grateful Dead, but maybe not my dirty underwear. Mm -hmm. And find out what is your arc that is the tie to the tie dye. Mm -hmm. And then find ways to develop trust. And the best way to develop trust, in my opinion, outside of transparency, is listen. Mm -hmm. Ask and listen. Make yeah. people feel heard. And, and don't do it in a judgmental way. Uh, then, of course, there are other ways to do it. But th that's sort of my arc that I wanted to bring in. And do you think that's going to be... Is that the biggest challenge and the best way to like make a difference, make improvements to everything we do? I think that's a bold statement. Um, you know, again, being pragmatic, if you need to put food on the plate, then just focus on that. You got to get food on the plate. You got to do what you got to do. And hopefully you're going to do it with a level of ethics that you'll feel good with. Mm hmm but some people forget about that and then do the a criminal thing, so to speak, or at least something they don't feel is good in order to get the food on the plate. And that will end up badly somehow. So it's about trying to nudge yourself forward. If you are aware that you have some bad parts, don't accept them as is. You can still improve them. Mm -hmm. Understand that you have them, but don't say I'm prepared to live with them. So there's an element of trying to improve yourself being aware of where you fall short and try to improve or at least compliment yourself with the right set of people a la travis kalanick who are going to come back and say hey listen buddy you fucked up yeah so that allows you to be called out and have that kind of a network around you so yeah. is it the answer to everything no uh, because there are other extenuating circumstances but i think that if you can be in a mode of understanding why you exist and and have some service to that every day, it's gonna make you feel better, have more energy and go out and do the, the things, which by the way, require energy to ch change the world, build your business, and, you know, rock forward. Perfect. That seems like sound advice. Keep stepping. Mm -hmm. I, I, I came across this kind of like um, this, this, well, I was speaking to somebody a few, well, months ago and they said, um, we decided we, we were gonna celebrate celebrate plodders because hmm. plodding feels like a good word there's kind of like some people kind of like almost like the idea of plod being a plodder is kind of gets denigrated a lot of the time because it's almost a bit like it's like slow kind of doesn't like have a lot of energy but actually plodding along has a almost like a relentlessness to it it's just kind of like the slower place, pace, and it kind of—it's just you know it's going to happen. You're going to get there. So rather than actually sprinting off, it's like I'm just plodding. I'm just keeping going, maintaining momentum, and I quite like that idea. The image that I have, as you say that, Adrian, is the image of a farmer, and and the idea of a farmer getting up early. By the way, good idea, and and putting your hands in the soil, mm -hmm. cultivating your garden, as Voltaire said. Uh, is such a, a relevant thing and having your hands in the soil reconnecting with the the dirt the dirt of life and they there there are some studies that are now coming out and showing how soil actually provides benefits to us and so i, I think reconnecting with earth in, in our citadel fast moving uh zip 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 type of life yeah let's plot a little bit more but don't forget to lean down no, can, absolutely. I mean, it's a bit like it reminds me of something that Darrow O'Brien said in a comedy sketch once. He said he was railing on this idea of everything is 99.9% .9 germ free. Now, he, said, he was like, whoa, 
what? He's like, when I was a kid, we were kind of out in the dirt and everything. Said, the best thing you could probably do for your kids right now is take them outside and put their face in the dirt. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and um, and 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 by the way, the social bugs that we need to carry around are healthy. So, yeah, we need we need to integrate some dirt into our lives. <laughs> uh, so, talking about something that come can some people uh, um, associate with being a bit dirty and a bit grimy or whatever. I want to talk to, I want to ask you a couple of questions about punk, punk CX, uh, because at the end of all the, any of these, these interviews, uh, assuming that there's nothing else that you want to add, obviously. All good, Adrian, me. all good, all good. Perfect. So the two questions I want, I always, I've been in these interviews, I've been collecting these words. And the first question is, what one word would you use, one or maybe two words, would you use to describe a punk approach to experience? Yeah, broadly. Oh, I would love to use the word anti-establishmentarianism. Oh, crumbs. Anti, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get that in, that's gonna be long. That's gonna yes, completely it's... screw up my list, but that's fine, brilliant. That's, yeah, well, I love it. And I think I haven't actually had a chance to use that in a proper mode ever. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> Relevance. Um, brilliant. And what company or brand do you, would you think epitomizes that sort of ethos, that sort of approach? And I will say kind of like what's been interesting is that some people have struggled on this, um, but some have also kind of like when they've struggled for like brands in terms of organizational brands, they've ended up picking people. Hmm as brands themselves and kind of what they've done and what they stand for, how they've operated and stuff. And so that sort of, if you like, field has got kind of wider. Well, in my world, Adrian, they ultimately, they ought to be the same. Mm -hmm. That is to say that not just the leader, but the individuals incarnate that spirit, because that's the only way uh, customer experience is going to work is if everybody is on the same song sheet singing. Sure. So I have a company and a person uh, ah, cool. and it's timely uh, because I, I, I can't say I ever bought a pair of shoes from them, but there's no doubt that Zappos created a punk customer experience, yeah. starting with their customer service and their incentive process, the allowance of satisfying customers for whatever it takes, led by a guy who sadly has died in Tony Shea, mm -hmm. who not only brought that punk CX attitude to his work, but brought it to his life. He may not have been a punk star. I can imagine, I think he was more into sort of indie music, but. He did he, sport a Mohican for a while. <laughs> there you go. He, he, he embodied a punkness to the way he led life, the way he experimented with all things, including drugs, food, living quarters. And, and so he used an embodiment for me, yeah. which Zappos was the expression of the punk CX. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more on these. He is a massive, massive loss for the whole Zappos organization. Um, <clears throat> downtown Vegas that he helped helped kind of regenerate um, everybody that read his book delivering kind of happiness or heard him to kind of talk uh, he will be sadly missed um, but hopefully remembered and celebrated for his contribution so thank you for shouting out Zappos and Tony Shane Minter that's it that's all I have um, just want to say uh, always a pleasure to talk to you um congratulations on the on on the on the new book i hope it goes fabulously well um and let me know when the the next one comes out we'll kind of line up another one but um yeah no thank you for your sharing your time and your experience and your insight and kind of everything with us today that's been awesome it's a pleasure adrian i'm definitely hopeful that this book will nudge a few people onwards people have any comments about it uh, i'm always happy to engage on twitter uh, m dial and otherwise um pleasure to speak with you adrian always fun makes me makes the little mind whir 
Uh, and so I've got to go out and put my hand in some dirt. Now that's my thinking. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And I always do, actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing kind of people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswinsco.com. One final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.